Hi, my name is Kirsten Gamble. I'm the Curator of Education at the Nantucket Historical Association. And on behalf of the NHA, I'd like to welcome you to our brand new whaling museum. For the next half an hour, I'm going to take you on an imaginary whale hunt around the world and give you a little bit of an idea of what it might have been like to be a whaler during the 18th and 19th century. Nantucket Island is an elbow of sand. Uh, 30 miles out to sea. It's a tiny island about the size of Manhattan, three and a half miles wide and 15 miles long. And during the 18th and early 19th century, this small elbow of sand really had the same reputation that Manhattan does today as a center of industry and commerce for colonial America. And that, of course, was the whale fishery, which was one of the important, most important colonial industries. But the first English settlers who came to Nantucket in 1659 didn't know anything about whaling. They didn't come here to hunt whales. They wanted to do exactly what they had been doing on the mainland, which was basically raising sheep and growing crops. And they quickly realized that neither of these plans was going to work out very well. First of all, the soil here is extremely sandy. It's difficult to grow anything beyond subsistence crops. Secondly, while raising sheep on an island makes a lot of sense because sheep can't swim and they can never get too far away from you on an island, you need running water. You need a river or a stream to power a fulling mill, which would turn the raw wool into a finished product like cloth. And even though we're surrounded by water, we don't have um, rivers or streams on the island, so we couldn't build a fulling mill. And gradually, the English settlers began to look around them for something else to do, and they started watching the Native Americans, the Wampanoag Indians. There were about 3,000 Wampanoags living here in 1659, and they did something that we call drift whaling. Hundreds of whales migrated past Nantucket every year. And when they would get sick or disoriented, they would wash ashore on the southeastern shore of the island. The Native Americans would go to them, they would cut them up, and they would use all of their different parts. They would use the meat for food. They used uh, the blubber for oil. And there's even evidence that they used the bones for their tools and also for their homes, which were called wetus. And you can see the shape of the rounded wee two, you can imagine them using the jaw bones of a right whale or the rib bones to frame those houses. So the English settlers decided they might like to try whaling, but it wasn't very efficient to just wait for the whales to wash ashore. They decided they needed to go out and get them. And that started happening around the year 1670. What happened then was a whale actually swam into Nantucket Harbor and it got stuck here. It swam around for about three days. It couldn't get back out of the harbor. And so one of the settlers fashioned a crude harpoon. He rowed out to the animal and killed it and dragged it back to shore. And that was the beginning of what was called shore whaling. Now, what were these animals that Nantucketers were hunting at this point? They were called right whales. And they got their name because they were the right whale to kill. There were a couple of different factors that made them the right whale to hunt. The first is that they're very slow moving, so they were easy to catch. They're also very friendly, docile, and trusting. They didn't swim away from boats if you would row up to them. The last thing is that they're very fat. They have a lot of blubber, which means that they float after you've killed them. And it also means they make a lot of oil. And so all of these qualities made them the right whale to hunt. And these were the ones that were swimming by Nantucket during the winter months. Right whales have a beautiful spout. If you were going to ask a child to draw a picture of a whale, what they would draw is the right whale spout up and out like a plume. And they eat using something called baleen. And you can see in this picture, the right whale doesn't have teeth. Instead, what he has are plates of baleen that hang down from his upper jaw. And there could be hundreds of plates of baleen hanging down. This piece of baleen we found out in Madiket. And um, it's about, I don't know, probably four feet long. But baleen could grow to be 12 feet long. 
And it's very flexible. It's made out of keratin, which is what our fingernails are made out of. And you can see on the back, it has hairs here. So what happens is the right whale will swim along the surface of the water. He'll take in a huge mouthful of water and fish and plankton and shrimp and all kinds of little sea life. And then he'll use his enormous tongue to push that seawater out. And all of that sea life, all the fish and shrimp, get stuck on these hairs. And he uses his tongue to lick it off and and swallow. He doesn't need teeth for chewing. He just swallows what he catches in his baleen. So we know what the right whale uses baleen for. What Nantucketers used it for was basically anything that we use plastic or spring steel for today. Baleen, when you heat it up, you can mold it into different shapes. So it was used for a woman's corset and her hoop skirt to make her nice and fashionable. It was used for buggy whips. Uh, it was even shredded up and stuffed into sofa cushions to make your sofa nice and comfortable. So there were a thousand different uses for baleen. So now Nantucketers have two products, the oil from the whale's blubber and the baleen from its mouth. And they decide they are going to start a whale fishery. They have no idea where to begin, so they need to hire an off-island consultant. And the man that they hire is a man named Ichabod Paddock. He comes over from Cape Cod, where they're already whaling, and he suggests that Nantucketers set up uh, whaling stations on the southeastern shore of the island, right where the whales are already washing ashore anyway. And these whaling stations are made up of a mast, a lookout that's up in the air, a man scanning the horizon for those beautiful plumed spouts of the right whale. And underneath that mast is a little hut because the whales are migrating in the winter between November and April. So his five teammates are down in that hut around a fire, keeping warm. And they're waiting for the lookout to call out that he sees a spout on the horizon. When he does, they run in a boat much smaller than this one. They row out to that point where they see the whale, and they kill it and drag it back to shore. And then they're going to process the whale right there on the beach in Sconset. They'll cut it up into smaller pieces, and they'll carry it back to town in a two-wheel cart, which was known as a calash. And this was called shore whaling. You're waiting on the shore and going out to get the whales and bringing them back to Nantucket. Well, Nantucketers got really good at, at shore whaling, or the whales got really smart and didn't swim as close to the island. And basically, they found themselves having to go out further and further to catch these whales. They started going out in sloops, in small fishing boats. And there's a story that in 1710, a man named Christopher Hussey was captaining a whaling sloop, and he got caught up in a storm. He was pushed way out to sea, much further than he had ever been before. And when the storm subsided, he found that he was surrounded by a pod of whales. But these were not the friendly, amiable, uh, right whales that he was used to. Uh, these whales were very aggressive. They had sharp teeth. Um, and they, were, they just seemed much more ferocious than what he was used to. He decided a whale's a whale, and he's going to kill it and cut it up. And when he cut it up and began to process it, he noticed that the head was filled with an incredibly pure oil that didn't even need to be boiled down. And what he had caught was a sperm whale. And from then on, Nantucketers really focused their hunt on sperm whales. Now, we have an amazing sperm whale hanging right here. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about this truly awesome creature. Sperm whales can grow to be up to 80 85 feet long. The one that's hanging here is 47 feet long, so that's almost twice as big as this whale. Sperm whales um, are creatures of extremes. Their head is, or their brain, is seven times larger than the human brain. They can hold their breath for two hours. So these are amazing creatures. And sperm whales, you can see, have teeth. They don't have um, baleen. They have sharp angled teeth. Sperm whales are pelagic whales, which means that they're deep diving whales. Their favorite food is the giant squid, and it lives one and a half or two miles down in the ocean. So their whole body is designed to dive deep down under the ocean surface and catch those giant squid with its sharp angled teeth. Now our teeth are flat because we use them for chewing. The sperm whale doesn't need them to chew. He just uses 
uses his sharp teeth for grabbing and holding on. He has terrible eyesight. He doesn't need to see very well because it's so dark deep down there in the ocean, but he needs excellent hearing. He finds his food doing something called echolocating. Echolocation is a sonar system, bats use it, and he'll send out a series of beeps and clicks and whistles and he'll wait for those sounds to bounce back to him and that's how he knows how far away he is from the giant squid. So the sperm whale is going to echolocate. He's going to try and find the giant squid. He has such a sophisticated sonar system in his head uh, that he can even see transparent squid. He can even feel where transparent squid are down two miles in the ocean. And when he finds it, he's going to grab on with his strong, powerful jaw with those sharp teeth. And then what he'll do is shoot to the surface as fast as he can. Now, if we did that, our bodies would just go crazy. We would need to have very sophisticated uh, submarine or equipment that we were wearing to protect our bodies. But the sperm whale, remember, his body is designed to withstand those changes in pressure from very deep down to up on the ocean surface. The giant squid can't handle it any better than we can. And so what happens is when the sperm whale shoots to the surface, the giant squid explodes in his mouth from the change in pressure. And the sperm whale swallows all of those little exploded squid bits. He doesn't need his teeth for chewing because nature chews his food for him. He just needs to hang on tight and then to swallow. Now the other really cool thing about the sperm whale is the case of spermaceti in its head. And you need to use your imagination from the tip of its upper jaw, six feet up in the air and back is that huge case filled with very valuable spermaceti oil. Now scientists are, are divided on what sperm whales use their spermaceti for. Some think it helps them dive down and then shoot back up to the surface quickly. And others think it helps them focus that sound like an ample so that they're really good at echolocating. Whatever the whale uses it for, we know what Nantucketers used it for. Spermaceti oil was extremely fine. It burned extremely clearly, and so it was used in lighthouses where you needed a perfect light. It also didn't freeze in the winter in cold temperatures, so you could use it in street lamps in places like New York or London where it would be cold outside. And it was um, used to lubricate machinery, and also it was turned into candles. Spermaceti candles were smokeless, odorless, and dripless. Before this time, candles were made out of animal fat. They were smelly. They tipped over all the time. They made a lot of smoke. So this was a huge advancement in technology. Nantucketers began to focus their hunt on the sperm whale, which mean they, meant they needed to go further and further away from the island. They needed to go down to the Carolinas and to Bermuda, but they always had to come back within six weeks because that's when the blubber would go rancid. And all of that ha changed in 1750 with the invention of something called the Triworks. The Triworks was basically an oven, a furnace that sat right on the deck of the whale ship. It sat in a shallow pool of water and allowed them to boil out the blubber, turn it into oil right there at sea. These ships turned into floating factories. And when the Triworks was invented, it meant that whaling ships could get bigger and bigger, 80 to 100 feet long, and they could be out catching whales and boiling down the blubber until their whole hold was filled. And that could take three or four or five years. They began circumnavigating the globe, going further and further into the South Pacific and then up into the Arctic where sperm whales like to live. So what would it have been like to be on one of these Nantucket whaling voyages? Well, let's imagine that you're a 14-year-old boy from Vermont You've grown up in the mountains on your family's farm and you are sick of it. There's nothing you want to do less than uh, tend to your family's cows and you want to go to the sea and you want adventure and a fortune. So you're going to head to Nantucket because that is where uh, the whaling industry is centered. 
and you're going to sign on for a whaling voyage. Whaling's about the only thing you can do at sea without any experience. It's really what you can do if you have never been to sea before. The first thing you need to do when you sign on to a voyage is negotiate your lay. And that means your paycheck. You're not going to be paid weekly while you're out on your whaling voyage. Instead, when you get back to Nantucket and all the oil that you've collected is sold off, you'll get a pre-negotiated fraction of that final take of the whaling voyage, the final profit of the voyage. Now, you don't know a lot about fractions. You probably don't know a lot about negotiating. And so you're negotiating a lay of one, one two hundredth of the final take of the voyage. The captain's probably making something like one fifteenth of the final take of the voyage. And then you'll head on board your whale ship and you're going to meet the captain and the mates. These look like fine, upstanding men. They're Quakers from Nantucket. They're dressed very soberly, very properly. And they remind you maybe of your teacher or a minister where you've grown up. And they look like nice, responsible men to work for. Um, but then you'll meet the rest of the guys. <laughs> These are the motley crew that you're going to be living with for the next three or four years. Now remember, whaling's the thing you can do if you can't do anything else. So these are escaped convicts, escaped slaves, men from islands you've never heard of before. Um, these are crazy kind of people that you've never seen in your life. Whaling was the lowest rung on the maritime ladder. And you're going to literally share a room with them with 18 of them at a time for the next three or four years. You're going to live in a place called the Foxhole. It's right up at the front of the ship, low ceiling. You can't stand up straight. Uh, there's no showers on this whale ship, so it's pretty smelly down there. That's where you'll eat. It's where you'll sleep. It's where you'll spend your free time. It's just a disgusting place. And right away, the captain is going to have you literally learn the ropes. You need to know everything you can so that once you see your first whale, you're ready to go. So you're going to learn all about the tools of whaling. You'll keep them sharp. You'll keep the deck nice and clean. Um, you'll learn knot tying and navigation. And you'll be assigned to a whale boat like this with five other men. And that's your whaling team. And you'll practice jumping into that boat and lowering it off and maneuvering it so that when you see that whale out on the horizon, you can get to it quickly. One of your jobs, which is scary at first, is the lookout or being on watch. In this job, you'll be 100 feet in the air, 10 stories in the air above the whale ship. And you can imagine the deck going back and forth and the mast swaying back and forth. You're just standing on a board called a cross T. You have a hoop around your waist, and you're scanning the horizon 180 degrees in one direction. There's a man with his back to you scanning 180 degrees in the other direction. And you're not looking for that beautiful plumed spout of the right whale. Because the sperm whale's head is so full of that important spermaceti oil, it has very little room for a spout, and it has a very pathetic little spout that goes off at a 45 degree angle, diagonally off the left side of its head, a little spurt, and that's what you're looking for, the diagonal spout on the horizon. So you're waiting and waiting, and it could be months before you see your first whale. And when you see the whale, you're so excited, you're looking, you're waiting. Is it really the whale? And when you decide, that this is it. This is the angled spout that you're waiting for. What are you going to cry out? Blows! There she blows! And you keep yelling and yelling until someone down on the deck below you cries out, where away? Which means, where is it? Which direction is it in? Now, you've learned your navigation, but you're a little nervous right now, so you're just going to point. Over there, that's where I see the spout. The captain will climb partway up the rigging. He'll take out his spyglass. He'll confirm, yes, that is the spout of the sperm whale. And he'll give the orders for all hands on deck and for the whale boats to be lowered. And at this point, everyone springs into action. You're all going to run to your whale boat. Something very strange happens, which is that you'll take off your shoes. And historians don't know why this happened, but they did the whale hunt barefoot. So you're going to take off your shoes, jump into the whale boat, lower it off the side of the ship, and start rowing to that point on the horizon. Now, six men at this point can row their boat at the rate of about 
uh, five miles an hour. So you could be rowing for a couple hours, two or three hours until you get to that point on the horizon where you see the whale. There are six men assigned to a whale boat like this one. And this whale boat here is from New Bedford, and it's from the early 20th century. It's a little bit bigger, about five feet longer than a Nantucket whale boat would have been. So you have to imagine an even smaller boat. And there are six men in here. The man at the back is the one in charge. He's the boat steerer. That's his title. He's probably the captain or one of the mates from the ship. Then up at front is the harpooner or harpooner, however you'd like to say it. He is the one who's in charge of attaching this boat to the whale. And in the middle are the four regular guys like you who are just rowing and rowing and rowing and rowing. And at this point, your goal is to get what's called wood to black leather, which means you want the wood of the boat right next to the skin of the whale because you're not going to throw the harpoon across the ocean like Gregory Peck does. Instead, you need to get as close as possible because you want to dart this very unwieldy object right into the back of the whale. The harpoon is basically a fish hook. It's just going to attach your little boat to the whale. It's not actually what kills the whale, but you can see it's, it's a big tool. So you're going to row as closely as possible to the whale. And when you get right up wood to black leather, the harpooner is going to put his left thigh right in this notch up here, which is called the clumsy cleat. That's so he doesn't fall out of the boat. And you can see he has two harpoons, and they're attached together with rope. There's 1,500 feet of rope or line in this boat that runs down the center of the boat, around the loggerhead at the back, and pays out of these tubs. So the harpooner is up at the front, his thigh in the clumsy cleat. He's going to dart that first harpoon in. If he has a couple extra seconds, he'll dart the second harpoon in so he's sure that he's fast. The whale's not hurt at this point. He's just more confused and sort of irritated. And his natural reaction is to take off. And your natural reaction is to hold on because he's going to start swimming as fast as he can away from this boat with the men in it. And you're going to hold on. The bow of the boat will dip down. Water will pour in. You're going to be bailing it out. You want to stay away from the center of the boat, because that's where all this line is whizzing around. You need to keep the loggerhead wet, all the rope wet, so that it doesn't catch on fire. And you're just going to hold on until the whale tires itself out. And that's when you're actually going to do the killing. This is probably the most exciting and scariest part of your voyage. It was called the Nantucket Sleigh Ride. And this whale could swim for miles before it gets tired. Now, during all this craziness of the Nantucket Sleigh Ride, something very strange happens which is that the boat steerer, who's the guy in charge at the back of the boat, and the harpooner, who's just attached you to the whale, are actually going to switch places. And the reason that they do that is because the harpooner's job is finished, and it's the boat steerer's privilege and responsibility to actually kill the whale. He's the man that's going to decide to literally cut his losses by cutting that rope that attaches you to the whale if the whale decides to sound, to dive deep down, and to threaten his men. So he's in charge. He moves to the front of the boat to kill the whale. So now the whale is tired, and you need to get right back up close to the whale again. And you're going to kill him with a different tool, which is called a lance. And you can see the lance is much bigger than the harpoon. And that's because you need to get through several, many feet of blubber till you can actually hit a part of the whale that would kill it. And you can see that the lance has a very sharp, leaf-shaped blade. You're aiming for a specific part on the whale, which is called the life of the whale. Remember, whales are mammals, like humans are. So their ribs protect all of their vital organs. So you're aiming for a spot right behind the left flipper. And you're going to plunge that lance in as deep as you can, the whole shaft all the way in. And you're going to start rotating it around. And you're going to rotate it around until you hit an artery or a major organ and you hear someone cry out in the boat, 
fire in the chimney, which means that the whale is starting to spout blood. It's not spouting water or air anymore. And you know that the whale is going to die. At this point, you need to get as far away from the whale as possible, because now it's not just irritated or confused. Now it's panicking, it's dying. And it, who knows what it could do. It's enormous flukes could come. They could flip your whole boat over. It could grab you in its jaws. It could sound down. So you want to get away from this whale as quickly as possible. Now, when the whale actually dies, your work has just begun. Because now you have to get it back to the mothership and process it. The mothership has sent off five small whale boats like yours, all pursuing different animals. It just stays where it is. You need to go back and find it. So a group of six men in a whale boat like this one can tow a 60-ton animal at the rate of about a mile an hour. If the whale took you on a five-mile sleigh ride, that's five more hours rowing back, towing a 60-ton dead animal behind you. And when you get to the boat, you're going to start processing it. You'll erect a flensing platform on the starboard side of the vessel. And you're going to start scoring the flesh. There'll be one man who's actually standing on the back of the whale's carcass. He has a monkey rope around his waist so that he doesn't fall into the ocean, because there are sharks surrounding this dead animal now. And his job is to put in the blubber hook into the first piece of blubber. And they'll score the whale every three feet or so and use a block and tackle on board the ship to peel the blubber off the animal, just like you're peeling an orange. You need to cut these three foot sections off every 15 feet or so, pull them up on deck. That weighs about 2,000 pounds. And then you're going to cut them into smaller and smaller pieces. Those first pieces are called blanket pieces, then horse pieces. Finally, they'll be minced into what's called Bible leaves, which are like the pages of a book. And that's what will be thrown into the, the cauldron, into the triworks. So the cooper on board the ship, the ship's carpenter, has started a fire on the triworks. And you'll start forking those pieces of blubber in, the Bible leaves of blubber in, boiling it down. You're actually um, going to start to get crackles on the top, just like if you're cooking bacon. And you'll skim it off with a baler like this, and you'll feed those crackles back to the fire to continue the fire going. Trying out of the animal, cutting it up and trying it out could happen over the course of three days and three nights continually. This went on 24 hours a day. It was smoky, smelly, bloody, oily, disgusting. You wouldn't get to eat regular meals. It was like a scene from hell. This was a horrible, horrible job. It was like working in a factory in the middle of the ocean. The next thing you need to do is probe the whale's intestines. Doesn't that sound like fun? You're going to start probing the whale's intestines looking for scar tissue. Because what happens when the whale eats its giant squid, its favorite dinner, there's one part of the squid that doesn't get digested. The squid has a beak like a bird does, a parrot does, and it often gets stuck in the whale's intestines. A cut happens, and then a scab forms around it. And sometimes the whales will throw that up, and sometimes it just grows to be hundreds of pounds in their stomach. It's known as ambergris, and it was used as a fixative in perfume. It was worth its weight in gold, because it could make fine perfume from France smell the very same on the last day you used it as on the day that you opened the bottle. So it was a really important thing. If you found ambergris in the stomach of your whale, you were pretty much set on this whaling voyage. The next thing you need to do is get all of that valuable spermaceti whale oil out of the head of the animal. If it's a small head, you can put it on the deck of the ship and scoop it out. If it's a big head, you'll keep it on the side of the ship. And you'll strip down the youngest guy on the boat. That's you. You'll put a monkey rope around your waist and lower you into the head so you can bail out the spermaceti oil. And that oil was so fine that it didn't need to be processed. It could be casked right away. The last thing the captain will ask is for the lower jaw to be cut off. And he's going to drag that lower jaw behind the ship for a couple of days till all the sharks and animals, sea life, eat all the flesh off of it. He's doing this not because there's any financial value to those teeth, although today there is 
but he's doing it as a favor to his crew because they'll take the whale teeth, they'll sand them down with shark skin, and then they're going to take needles and pins and other um, tools and they'll engrave drawings onto the teeth. They'll fill those in with ink or with soot from the triworks, and they'll make presents to bring home to their family, souvenirs of their voyage. And this American folk art is known as scrimshaw. So now you've caught and killed and processed your first whale. The whole thing beginning to end has taken probably four or five days. How many more times do you have to do this before you can go back to Nantucket? 50 to 60 times. It took 50 to 60 whales to fill the hold of a whale ship with huge casks like this one, little casks like the one in the corner. Every nook and cranny was filled with casks of whale oil. Let's say for our discussion today, this is our last whale and the captain's giving the orders to head back to Nantucket. The first thing that you wanna do is take any tool you can find, you're gonna go to that brick triworks and you're gonna break it apart, throw it into the ocean. There are two reasons that you want to do that. The first is that the fastest way home is around Cape Horn. There are always storms there. It's very windy. And it would be difficult to go around Cape Horn with a boat that's top heavy, uh, filled with bricks that have been used to process 60 animals. The other reason is a more symbolic reason. You don't want the captain to stop for just one more whale on your way back to Nantucket. And if there's no try works, there's no way he can do that. You'll sail into Nantucket Harbor and right there on the wharfs where you all sailed in today, these huge casks of whale oil will be offloaded and sold there. And now it's your payday. All the oil's been sold off. It's been rolled into candle factories like the one next door. And it's time for you to collect your 1 200th of a lay. That's going to make you about $150 to $200 for your four years of work. It's not enough to make you want to go out whaling again. You'll probably head back to Vermont and work on your family's farm. The men who continued with whaling were the captains whose families supported them. They were from Nantucket. They owned pieces of factories, cooperages, sail lofts, rope walks. They were tied into all part of the business. And they could make enough money by the time they were a captain uh, to retire in their 40s as a millionaire. Well, whaling's, uh, whaling dominated Nantucket's economy for about 100 years, from roughly 1750 until about 1850. In the middle of the 19th century, a bunch of things happened all at once that brought whaling to a close very quickly. The first was that a sandbar formed over the mouth of Nantucket Harbor. It became very difficult to get these 100-foot whale ships heavily laden with cargoes of whale oil up and over that sandbar and into our harbor. It was much easier to go to New Bedford, where there was a deep water port. And there was also a railroad connection, so you could get whale oil all across the country. In 1846, a fire happened in downtown Nantucket. In one evening, seven out of eight Nantucketers lost their jobs as the entire business district burned to the ground. This was a town saturated in whale oil. Whale ships exploded, warehouses exploded. It was a terrible, terrible scene, and Nantucketers needed to rebuild their infrastructure rather than heading back out to sea. Three years later came the California Gold Rush. It attracted young men who were looking for adventure and fortune. It was much easier for them to jump ship in California and pan for gold than it was to stay out at sea hunting whales. Then in 1851, oil was discovered in Titusville, Pennsylvania. And kerosene was developed. And we didn't need to hunt whales anymore for lighting purposes. By the time the Civil War came around, Nantucket's population had plunged from 10,000 people to less than 3,000 in only 10 years. Everyone left because there was no work here anymore. The men who were here were sent off to fight in the Civil War, over 400 of them. Nantucket whaling ships were actually sunk as barricades around southern cities like Savannah as part of the Civil War. 
In 1869, the last Nantucket whale ship, the Oak, left the harbor and it never returned. It was sold off for parts in South America. And that was the end of our one industry, which today has been replaced by a second industry, tourism, which is why so many of you have come today. And we're so glad that you've stopped by our whaling museum and let us share a little bit of our history with you. Thanks for coming.